Sabina strays into deep water. Who is she? Sabina Hossenfelder is a theoretical physicist and she has a popular YouTube channel. Most of her stuff is very informative accounts of current controversies in physics or other recent scientific research. And she generally defends a strongly materialist view of reality. In the last year or so, though, she started to branch out and started to produce what are essentially political videos, which fall below her normal scientific standard. In particular, I want to comment on a very recent one called Capitalism as Good. As you might guess from the title, it's a nakedly ideological account. It suffers from factual errors, lack of evidence for its conclusions, and theoretical gaps, which she would never tolerate if the subject under consideration was her own field of physics. Okay. It's a, a very high-speed run through various economic topics, starting out with money. And she starts out with a attempting to explain what money is and what she gives is the standard account you'll get in Economics 101, ultimately derived from the Austrian economist Menger, which is that money arises to overcome the problems of barter. This is the fable that's taught in economics classes. The problem is it's, it's just a fanciful just-so story. It's not based on history. Now, the illustration I've used here is from Rudyard Kipling's book of Just So Stories. And it's the story of how the elephant got its trunk. And the long and the short of it is the elephant didn't have a trunk once, but went to have a drink by the river and the crocodile grabbed his nose and he pulled back and his nose was stretched out to become a trunk. Now, the just-so stories are ones which are constructed to have a superficial veneer of plausibility but are totally at variance with the facts. And Kipling wrote them in such a way that children could tell that it was a totally fanciful story. However, these stories are told to economic students. She's attempting to deduce a history of money by projecting back the free individual agents of petty bourgeois society into the distant past. And in doing so, this replaces the real history that's been uncovered by archaeology with imaginary stories. Our earliest records of money is as money of account, not as commodities, not as tokens, but accounting money recorded in cuneiform tablets from Mesopotamia. And they used a unit of account being the shekel. And it was a a volume of barley. It's like using, you know, um, a thousand litres of barley as, or a bushel of barley as your unit of account. And this was the unit against which other use values were reckoned. But what we have it as is in accounts of produce due to temples and palaces. Uh, a given volume of dates or a certain number of goats could be translated into an equivalent tax liability in terms of barley. So the peasants who are being exploited and taxed by the priests might some deliver barley, others might deliver goats, others might deliver dates. 
and all of these would be expressed in ratios of shekels. But this doesn't seem to have arisen in private trade. Insofar as there was trade, it seems to have been trade between agents of temple complexes or between separate nations, not nation states, separate kingdoms. If, if you're interested in the actual history of money, it's worth reading Polanyi's book, Trade and Market in Early Empires, or Graeber's uh, Debt the First 5,000 Years, and the book that I contributed to, Classical Econophysics, has also got a couple of chapters on the, the history uh, of, of how money arose. In fact, as a physicist, Sabina might be interested in the question of why is it the economic value, why is it that monetary value has the metric space properties that it does have? Why does it have a modified L1 metric metric rather than an L2 metric? Which, on many grounds, you'd expect things to have. Now, she talks about token money. She, of course, knows that we don't have commodity money. And she knows that banknotes have no intrinsic value. But she says that they circulate because the state enforces the circulation of banknotes. Now, this is only partially true. Her account leaves out what actually determines the value of banknotes. The UK government may say that it's only pounds are valid for the settling of commercial debt. But that is only for commercial debt that is incurred in pounds. It doesn't prohibit people paying for things in euros or dollars. Pounds are acceptable for debts denominated in pounds, but international banking would be impossible if you weren't able to conduct, con contract debts in multiple currencies. Now, Sabina says the value of a token currency is based on faith, a literal translation of it being a fiduciary currency. But why should it have any particular value if it's a matter of faith? Why should a car cost £15,000 and not £15? Having a theory about something quantitative but with no means of tying the quantities down would never be accepted in her field. If you look at some of the criticisms of <coughs> String theory, they are along those lines. Now, what is the actual mechanism? It's all very well for me to criticise that, but there is a mechanism. Token money is tied to the process of surplus appropriation by the state or the upper classes in society. Its origins were in tax debts and the measurement of tax debts. As such, it was a form of information structure or record keeping. It seems that the Babylonian system was all in terms of cuneiform records kept by the priestly castes. No actual tokens circulated. Similarly, in ancient Egypt, there were no actual money tokens. Money tokens first seem to have been issued by the Chinese Empire and in Lydia. Um, about 700 BC, I think, in Lydia. The, the precondition for this is that you have a state, an empire, that's able to extract a portion of the total labour of society. And this can be done explicitly in terms of what was called robot in the Balkans or corvée in France, or it can be comm commuted into an obligation to render a tax, render to tax collectors tokens which are issued by the state. And since the only way to have these tokens would be to serve in the army or serve in a labour gang or provide the empire with material goods, 
the levying of a tax in token money forces into existence a monetary economy and commodity circulation. I've talked in other videos about how this was exactly the process that the British Empire used in Africa to enforce the circulation of token money denominated in pounds. It obliged those it had conquered to pay a poll tax in colonial currency. And the only way they could get the colonial currency was to deliver cocoa or other goods to the colonial authorities. And this creates a monetary economy. It doesn't come into existence through free agents bartering. Now, why are dollars valuable? Well, the background gives the, the hint. In the USA, they're valuable because the Department of the Treasury forces citizens to render definite quantities of tax levied in dollars. To obtain these, they must either work or trade in the market economy. It's no good being a self-sufficient backwoodsman if you're being su subjected to tax. And the ultimate source of dollars is the federal government itself. Here's the US um, breakdown of the budget a few years ago. Ignore the red and green areas. They're basically redistribution of dollars from agents in the private economy via the state. The blue area is military expenditure, a huge quantity, 62 billion in um, 2019, 2018. Um, there's a similar amount of purchases of goods and services directly by the federal government for civilian purposes. This is the, these are the, act, the orange and blue are the actual resources appropriated by the government. Now, each dollar token therefore represents the total number of hours of work directly or indirectly delivered to the government or appropriated by the state divided by 1.3 trillion, which is the total amount the federal government issued to command those resources. It is the original appropriation of resources by the state for which the state issues these tokens that determines the value of the tokens. Sabina claims that the account she's given comes from Adam Smith. I have a passing familiarity with Smith and I find her claims on this to be a bit dubious and it would be much more plausible were she able to cite actual passages from Smith justifying this. So what was Smith's key observation about money? This is the statue of Smith in Edinburgh. Money, he wrote, is the power to command the labour of others. And he says that in a comment on Hobbes. <coughs> Here we have the statue in the twin city Glasgow on the other side of the town, other side of the country, and this is of the Duke of Wellington, the symbol of that power of command of the British state. And you'll notice both of them are wearing traffic cones, which is the ridicule to which they are subjected. These symbols are subjected by a class conscious Scottish population. There's another absurd inaccuracy in her account about when the Industrial Revolution occurred and why it occurred. Sabina's account is that capitalism is established, it then fosters science, and this starts the, hundred, the Industrial Revolution 180 years ago, 150 years ago. She's, there's, she says this at a particular point in the video. Now, this is a, a painting of an area of 
Glasgow that would have been completed around 150 years ago. As you see, a well-developed industry, industrial city already. It means she's dating the Industrial Revolution from the 1870s, which is at least a century too late. Economic historians would normally say that the Industrial Revolution started in the 18th century. Here, for example, is a British shipyard 20 years before she says the Industrial Revolution started. It's clearly an industrial shipyard. The Industrial Revolution had, had taken place 100 years earlier. But what's particularly striking, coming from a scientist, is she, she denies the importance of science to the Industrial Revolution. She denies that scientific advances triggered the Industrial Revolution. Instead, she says it's capitalist rational, rationality. And this is just historically wrong. The sequence is wrong. First point is that money and money capital were well established in the ancient world. If you read Tacitus' Annals, he describes credit crises. He describes credit crises which spread from Alexandria to Rome, whose capital there, whose money capital, but Roman owners of capital didn't lend to purchase machinery. They lent to purchase land, horses or slaves. Now why did they do this? It's because in an age when energy came from muscles, that's all you could do. The Industrial Revolution rested on steam power. Without it, the wheels of industry would not have turned. Now the preconditions for that were scientific developments. And the scientific developments took off before industrial capitalism. It's worth reading the work by her fellow physicist Rossi on the first scientific revolution, that which took place in Hellenistic Greece. And he points out the role of competing post-Alexandrian states in funding science, in funding the library at Alexandria, in funding Archimedes to do his research. This didn't start occurring again until the 1600s and 1700s, when you saw the founding of the Royal Society, the Prussian Academy of Sciences, etc. And these then provide the preconditions for steam power. It, they provide this, the research from the 1600s provided the research you needed. The key discoveries had to, that had to be made before James Watt could build his atmospheric engine. Immediately, it depended on the work of the physicist Black in the 1760s, which was carried out in a definitely pre-capitalist institution, the University of Glasgow, which was founded in the 1400s by the Pope. And it also depended on the prior work of Torricelli and Pascal in the 1640s. Without that theoretical work, it would not have been possible to build the engines. Now, <clears throat> she cites the example of Fleming. Sabine says it was that the success of penicillin was not due to scientists like Fleming who discovered it, saying that other people had noticed that moulds inhibited bacteria, but it was due to the big pharmaceutical companies taking it up and mass producing it. Without industrial scale production, it would just have been a curiosity. Well, it's certainly true that industrial scale production was required, but it was only because it happened to take place in the US in the 1940s 
where it was first mass produced, that it was countless mass production. You required mass production, but the fact that it occurred in a capitalist economy meant that it, if there was to be mass production, it was going to be capitalist mass production. But why not take the example of nuclear power? The very first nuclear reactor in Chicago, which wasn't producing effective power, um, was a state-directed enterprise. And the first effective power reactors, first nuclear power stations, were constructed in Obninsk in the USSR in 1954, and the second one at Chapel Hall in Britain in 1956. In both cases, these were carried out by state or socialist enterprises, explicitly socialist in the Soviet case and the British case within the socialist subsector of the economy, the state-owned and directed sector of the economy that had been set up by the Labour Socialist Government in the year 1940s. And if we look at who can build nuclear power plants now, it's the Chinese and French state companies. When Britain wanted a new nuclear power station after Thatcher's privatisation had destroyed the state's capacity to build power stations, they had to bring in the French and the Chinese to do it. Now, Sabina has a minute or two on Marx, no, a few seconds on Marx, but it's, it gives me the impression she's not really read much of him, since Marx is fulsome in his praise about the ability of capitalism to bring technical progress. So she wouldn't have found that much contradiction to her claims that capitalism brings co technical progress in Marx. Her account on microeconomics is as if the Soviet mathematical school never existed. The point about <coughs> Kantorovich, for which he got what was is misleadingly called a Nobel Prize in economics, since it isn't really the Nobel Prize. The point about Kantorovich is that he put the problem that marginalist economics claims to solve into a formal mathematical framework that rendered it algorithmically solvable. Textbook Western economics, with its supply and de demand curves, is mathematically underdetermined as a theory, and, and it would never be tolerated in a rigorous domain like physics. You would never be allowed to propose a theory which had more free variables and observa than observables. <coughs> if Sabina's watching this and is interested, she could consult my video on Samuelson epicycles and neoclassical economics. The overall effect of her video is there's a, an awful lack of evidence to back up claims. She claims that the free market is superior, but what does she give as examples? She says, oh, the non-free market examples are Cuba and North Korea. But what about basic scientific practice? What about experimental procedure? Where are her controls? You can't test something without a control. How would a capitalist car be an island? Let's say Jamaica or South Korea as a land example have done, if, it, if Jamaica and South Korea were faced with the hostility of the world's 
largest military power, had sanctions applied to them, were denied supplies of and technology. How would an isolated capitalist Jamaica in a socialist world have done? How would an isolated South Korea in a socialist world have done? You can't take that as a plausible example. <clears throat> If you are going to go for a, uh, a counterexample, let's let's take real economies of comparable scale. I'm going to take the UK, which was the classic capitalist economy, and the USSR, which is the classic socialist economy. And I've plotted their GDP growth over time. And it's pretty clear which one was more efficient at generating GDP growth. At the start of the period, I've taken 1928, because uh, that's when socialist planning was introduced in the USSR. The UK was the dominant world power. Overwhelmingly the dominant world power. After 40 years of socialism, US... SR had totally eclipsed it, both as an economic and a military power. I note, I've chosen Britain's best years. The years from 1945 to 1970 are the best years of British growth in history. And that's because those are the years that Britain didn't have a purely capitalist economy. It had strong socialist elements in the economy. Over that period, the long-term growth rate was 3.5%. In the pre previous period of liberal capitalism, free market capitalism, from the 1850s up to then, the growth rate was 1.25%. 1 and if you take the period since free market capitalism was restored by Margaret Thatcher, the growth rate's been 1.9%. So the evidence is that the free market system does worse in comparable conditions. It's not the most rational or efficient way of organising production. It's an un-evidence un claim, a claim that's justified by beautiful stories. In my book, How the World Works, for instance, I cite evidence given by economic historians based on detailed statistical analysis of the Doomsday Book that even 11th century feudalism compared favourably in its efficient use of economic resources with contemporary capitalism. You don't have to have a capitalist economy to use economic resources rationally. Obviously, the technology available now is totally different. Modern farmers have the harbour process and tractors, so they can produce an awful lot more than farmers could in 1080. But that's due to science, it's not due to capitalist rationality. And there are theoretical reasons why this is, why it's uh, less efficient than other forms, and they relate to the way labour inputs are costed in capitalism. Capitalists have a constant incentive to keep wages low, but low wages militate against adopting new and more efficient methods of production. And this tends to slow things down. Sabina Hossenfelder does her intellectual reputation no good if she weakens her usually rigorous assessment of theoretical coherence and empirical evidence in order to make a political point that she thinks will sit well with a YouTube audience. 